Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily O'Reilly. I'm the European Ombudsman, and you're all most welcome to what I think is going to be uh, a very useful, hopefully, uh, and even um, provocative and uh, entertaining even uh, uh, seminar. It's a very important uh, topic. I think we're coming to it as well in a very important week um, in the life of the European Union in terms of the uh, parliamentary scrutiny that is going to be on the, uh, the new commissioner's uh, designate. And already we have a, an issue that has emerged over the last uh, week or so in, in relation to uh, who has responsibility for uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices, the proposal to move it from uh, DG uh, Sanko to DG Industry. And some of you may have been aware of a, a letter that President Schulz um, um, sent to the Commission President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, in relation to that just uh, towards the end of last week. So this is a very, very uh, current and a very important um, issue for all of us. Um, I'm delighted that so many people uh, have signed up to this event, particularly uh, on a Monday morning, and we have representatives from uh, Parliament, uh, from the Commission, from the legal profession, uh, from industry, uh, from public affairs, consultancies, uh, from NGOs uh, and activists. And I hope you all contribute to this debate. This isn't just about the people who are speaking here, it's about all of you. Uh, it's such a vital uh, issue uh, to all of us um, and to the people that we represent and we serve. And we are very anxious um, to get your views and uh, for you to interrogate um, the, the, the people and the issues that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we are um, dealing with today. Um, so I'll be saying a few more words later on, and I'd now like to hand over to our chair uh, for this morning, Mr. Frédéric Simon, who is the publisher and editor of Your Active. Frédéric. Thank you very much, Emily, and welcome to all of you. Uh, briefly introducing the topic, as Emily said, the uh, debate that we're having today is, is timely for several reasons. Uh, first, because we have a new uh, clinical trials regulation which was adopted earlier this year, so now is a good moment to try and take stock and see uh, what this brings in terms of transparency. And second, also because the European Medicines Agency is uh, about to take an important decision this week about its own uh, proactive transparency policy. So that could be also a, uh, a defining moment in terms of uh, transparency in, the, in clinical trial data. And more, uh, more widely, as Emily said, uh, there's also a changing political environment. We have a new commission coming in and uh, important shifts that uh, President Juncker has proposed uh, for the health sector, shifting areas away from DG Sanko and into the remit of DG Enterprise. And so uh, for many, this raises uh, quite fundamental questions, in fact. Can, can public health and the pharmaceutical sector be treated like any other business? Is there not a specific responsibility that comes when you're dealing with public health issues and therefore calling for greater transparency in how the scientific data uh, is being shared? And at the same time, of course, the pharmaceutical sector has got quite legitimate concerns about maintaining uh, its activity as a healthy business and therefore protecting its commercial interests and, and secrecy to some degree. Uh, after all, we wouldn't benefit from all uh, these medicines if it wasn't for the, uh, for the pharmaceutical sector investing in, in, a, in innovation, in new medicines. Uh, it's a pretty huge market when you think about it. More than 20 billion every year is being invested in medical research for, in theory, at least the benefit of us all. So where exactly shall we uh, draw the line here? Uh, how far can you actually go with uh, transparency? Um, and, and where actually is full transparency achievable or even desirable? So these are some of the questions uh, that the speakers today will be trying uh, to answer. So we'll be starting by hearing each one of them uh, in turn. Um, each have prepared a five-minute statement, and so let me insist again on trying to stick to that time. And after that, we'll be um, opening the floor to your questions, to your remarks. Uh, we've got lots of competent people in, in the room. I'm certainly not one of them, so I'll be counting on you to, uh, to make intelligent remarks and put questions to the uh, panelists today, which 
Uh, I'm introducing uh, here again, so Emily O'Reilly, the European Ombudsman, uh, sitting to my right. Margaret Oaken, who's the Shadow Rapporteur, was the Shadow Rapporteur on the Clinical Trials Regulation. Uh, ben Goldacre, here. Uh, Well-known physician and academic, uh, academic, who is also the author of the best-selling book, Bat Pharma. Guido Razzi from the European Medicines Agency, and finally Richard Backstrom from FPA, uh, the European Pharma Industry Association. So without further ado, uh, let me start by giving you the floor, uh, Emily, for your five-minute introductory speech. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Frederic. Um, I'd like to set out over the next uh, few minutes the arena of this debate from the viewpoint of the European Ombudsman. But before I do that, I want to make some personal observations about the pharmaceutical industry. I first visited New York City in 1983, just as consciousness of the emerging HIV AIDS epidemic was reaching a peak. By that time, many friends of mine, young gay men, had left a deeply hostile atmosphere towards homosexuality in Ireland to embrace the accepting culture, particularly of the East Coast of America. Many of them, in the late 1980s and 1990s, subsequently died from AIDS-related illnesses. Thirty years later, all has changed. HIV infection has become a treatable and may even become a curable disease. Scientific and pharmaceutical advances have made it possible to categorize HIV as a chronic illness rather than necessarily a terminal one. Many with HIV can now, as a result, live full lives, at least in the wealthy first world. As a child in the 1960s, my generation routinely caught measles, rubella and mumps, with children dying every year as a result. To a large degree, all of those diseases are now contained through vaccines, again, at least in the developing world and the developed world. I make these points so as not to lose sight, as Frederic has already mentioned, of the profound good that developers of medicines do. Medicine saves lives. Pharmaceutical companies, many of which invest billions to identify, develop and bring to market new medicines, are responsible for alleviating the suffering of many people. It is in the public's interest that the industry be enabled to work well and encouraged in particular to put its expertise and financial muscle to greater use in the developing world where millions still die from what are easily preventable illnesses in the first world. But when we take medicines or when we give medicines to our families, to our children, we do so not as scientists but as trusting and largely ignorant lay people. If that trust is undermined, we all lose out. Most importantly, people who become wary of taking certain medicines may put themselves, and in some cases, others at risk, as when an insufficient number take up a vaccine in a population and the relevant disease is either re reawakened or never fully subdued. Parents face this dilemma frequently. Should I trust that the vaccine prescribed to prevent my daughters getting cervical cancer in middle age will do them more good than harm? Should I trust the anti-acne treatment prescribed for my son when I read of reports of suicidal ideation or am aware of cases of young adult suicides in the course of taking the drug? When a pandemic flu scare prompts panicked public health systems to rush out a vaccine, how do I know that it's completely safe? If I sense that the truth is being withheld or spun, my trust in that and other medicine will be diminished with potential negative consequences for myself or for my family. It would seem therefore rational to the ignorant but trusting lay people that the information which was used to reach the conclusion that a medicine is safe and effective be subjected to extensive independent review. After all, the very nature of science of reliable science is that evidence and the conclusions drawn from that evidence will be open to review by others. It would also seem rational that pharmaceutical companies themselves should be more than willing to build trust in their products through transparency. Trust builds the bottom line. Scientists who work for regulators who are entrusted with the task of verifying that medicines are safe and effective also have an interest in transparency. They know that it is only through transparency that their work can be reviewed by their peers and, if necessary, improved. They know that if they are prevented from being transparent, their work will be less reliable 
are perceived as less reliable. As European Ombudsman, I have a responsibility to ensure that the EU public administration acts transparently. <laughs> this is particularly important in relation to those EU agencies that are entrusted to ensure that products and practices used and executed in Europe are safe. I have therefore instructed my staff to pay careful attention to the work of the EU's regulatory agencies, such as the European Chemicals Agency, the European Aviation Safety Agency, the European Food Safety Agency, and the European Medicines Agency, the EU agency with responsibility for evaluating the safety and efficacy of medicines before they can be placed on the market in Europe, and for monitoring the effects of medicines that are already on the market. In early September, I wrote to the Food Safety, Chemicals and Aviation Safety Agencies to ask them about their plans to adopt transparent policies. This was inspired by EFSA's public consultation on its efforts to become an open science organisation and from information that we had received that ECHA and EASA are also looking into this question. I suggested that the Open Government Partnership Initiative could be useful inspiration for their work. It was therefore enormously encouraging that the European Medicines Agency, at the insistence of the Ombudsman, who had investigated the agency's refusals to release information on the effects of anti-obesity and anti-acne drugs, and at the insistence of campaigners who had long sought greater transparency, transformed its approach to transparency in 2010. It was encouraging that the agency began to respond positively to requests for public access to clinical study reports and even to fight in court attempts by some pharmaceutical companies to block the release of those reports. It was encouraging that it committed to adopting a proactive transparency policy. I am not in this brief address going to deal with subsequent events other than to say that I am continuing to examine closely whether the European Medicines Agency continues to be as committed to transparency, and I will look forward to Mr Rassi outlining the challenges he has faced in this area. I have, in the last five months, opened three transparency investigations concerning the Agency. The first concerns public access to clinical study reports relating to an important anti-inflammatory drug, that inquiry was prompted by the settlement reached between the agency and the pharmaceutical company that markets that drug, which involved the pharmaceutical company dropping its court case against the agency in return for the agency agreeing not to disclose parts of the clinical study reports. My staff has already carried out an inspection of the agency's file in that case, and I will shortly ask the agency to respond in writing to a series of questions. I have also, following a complaint from a journalist, opened an inquiry relating to public access to the agency's databases. Finally, I have opened an inquiry relating to a refusal by the agency to give access to submissions made to it by industry and others on the agency's revised proposals to make its documents available proactively. Separately, I can inform you that once that revised proactive policy is adopted by the agency as planned very shortly, I will examine it closely to ensure that it meets the highest of standards. So with that brief overview of the role that my office is playing in this area, thank you for your attention and hand you back to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm turning to Margaret Orkin now uh, to speak about the Clinical Trials Directive. Yeah. <coughs> Emily, for organising this uh, important event, uh, I really think that uh, we are having great successes behind and are facing big challenges. Even if we uh, won, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but I can tell you when we had the regulation passed, it, was, it wasn't just a piece of cake uh, to get it through, and we were under quite heavy pressure. And the feeling is that we are still under quite heavy pressure. Uh, just, uh, uh, you know, in headline, Clinical, the, the clinical trials regulation is quite uh, technical uh, and complicated, but basically uh, it's not difficult to understand that transparency is for the good of the patients, the good of humans. It's to them, and they, it's their interest who should be in our focus first and foremost. And that has been in our law before, when we look to the transparency law from 2001, 1049, it's clear there that, uh, you know, that human health 
and environment can, can uh, go, uh, go in f before uh, commercial interest, which is so often forgotten, not at least from the Commission. And therefore, that, now I come to the, uh, the, uh, the, one of the real challenges we are, we are facing now. Just one, no, just one thing more, just to, to remind you how heavy this is. Although we got big support in Parliament, all groups except ECR uh, were in favour and we were pushing for it and we got the Council with us. Uh, then, uh, you know, we, we learned just uh, when we had the electoral campaign that the big farmer in the United States are, you know, picking exactly to that law in the TTIP negotiations. And they want to, what are you saying, deregulate or simplify or what, what kind of language they use when they want to get rid of it. Just to tell you, we are up against real big people here. Uh, Secondly, I think, please remember that uh, a, a clinical trial belongs first to the patient who has exposed her or himself. Secondly, to humanity. If you ask them, they will never admit it belongs to industry. Never. Of course not. And, that, uh, and you know, it's so simple to explain to people if you go outside this house here. I think that was one of the reasons why it was quite easily won. We were just before elections and people could see, uh, the council could see how easy it would be for us to, uh, to campaign this issue, which it was and which we did. But it was a victory. But then we saw now, as Emily just mentioned, what happened to the pharmaceutical industry or well, they survived or what they did. But they managed, and I'm sure it's the industry, who managed to, uh, to push younger to move again in the uh, pharmaceutical industry out of DG Sanko to DG Enterprise as if was profit the main task. And uh, I think we should do our best and all the, all the coordinators except the one from the ECR and EFDD has uh, now addressed, addressed Juncker in order to get it back on, on, on the right track. And uh, I think that um, we might manage to do this here. Uh, we are going to face, it will be really a, a, a topic in the hearings we have in the coming days, and, but we probably get an answer from to the coordinators from the, uh, from the uh, commission, uh, from Juncker today. Two things I want to stress here. Uh, first is um, that it's not only about uh, direct human health, it's also about our health budgets. Because some of the things that happened in the past and it's happening now uh, are that it's, it's, it's close to a robbery. The, the, the rush, when they sold, sold Tamiflu to everybody, knowing that it didn't work more than, better than the paracetamol. It's really, you know, that, I, I consider that a disaster. And we had the other day, last week, in, uh, in the plenary in the parliament, we was discussing uh, the, produce, uh, the product uh, Suvalti, which can be uh, treat hepatitis C. And, you know, it's, it, the cost of producing it is about 100 euro. They sell it for 50,000 50, euro per portion. To me, it's, yeah, well, it's close to, close to criminality. Secondly, and that's another fight, oh, I have to stop now, just to mention very fast. The secondly, I think we have to look also, it's not a question of transparency, but we have to look into to, uh, conflict of interest. And please remember, conflict of interest is an objective criteria. It's not enough to declare that you have it. You must not have it when we are dealing with this issue. And that fight is not won yet, but I think we have to face that one too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Let me turn to Ben uh, Goldacre, who is... Uh, well-known author, and uh, I think we're really lucky to have you today uh, speaking in this panel. So uh, let's hear from, from you. Thanks. Oh. Can you hear me now? More? More? Uh, so I, I, I think this is actually very simple and very straightforward. We, we cannot make informed decisions about which treatment is best 
as long as important information about the methods and results of clinical trials are withheld from doctors, withheld from academic researchers, and withheld from patients. And to be absolutely clear, this isn't in any sense about being anti-industry. Academics are just as bad at failing to share the methods and results of their clinical trials. The key difference is that it's only industry that actively lobbies against change. So to be clear, there are four levels of information that we need about a clinical trial. We need to know, firstly, that it's happened at all. We need for that trial to be registered. Secondly, we need a brief summary of the methods and results, the kind of thing that you might find in a journal publication. Thirdly, we need the clinical study report, a more detailed story, because the devil is often in the detail. And then lastly, we need individual patient data so that we can replicate analyses and do better ones. Now, for each of these, there has been appalling progress, bad arguments against transparency. And for each of them, there are small details which need to be managed in the delivery, but nothing that poses any serious barrier. For registration, we just need to know that a trial has happened. This has been promised for three decades now, and it's still not been delivered adequately. For summary methods and results, we simply need a brief description of what you did and what the results were for every trial that's conducted. We know from the best currently available evidence that when you look at a group of trials that have been conducted and completed, and then you go and look to see if they were published, on average, the chances of a trial in those studies being published is about 50-50, and trials with positive results are about twice as likely to be published as trials with negative results. The first study showing that this was a problem and calling for universal registration and publication was in 1986. We've had promises ever since then. We've still not adequately delivered on ensuring that all results of all trials on all uses of all medicines are made properly available. Bizarrely, it's required under the FDA Amendment Act 2007. Everybody danced in the streets, assumed that this meant that it was fixed forever. Nobody did an audit. When we finally did an audit, we found that, in fact, this rule was only obeyed in one case in five. Clinical study reports, I think, are much more interesting because it turns out the devil is often in the detail. There are often methodological shortcomings in the design of a trial that mean that it's no longer a fair test of which treatment is best. And these methodological shortcomings are often glossed over in the very brief description of a trial that you get in a journal article or in posting on a website like clinicaltrials.gov. So this is why we ask for access to clinical study reports, so that we can see, were there any protocol changes? This is very important to know. If a protocol changes during the course of a trial, that could mean that there has been uh, somebody seen something in the results, they want to change the analysis in a way that's more flattering. We need to see that protocol change. Often, information on adverse events is very incompletely reported in journal articles but much more completely reported in clinical study reports. So we need access to these full documents. That is something that has been contested by industry to the point of essentially almost an absolute barrier. We've seen legal cases against the European Medicines Agency. We've seen extraordinary chewing gum thrown into the gears of any attempt to produce more transparency. But these are perfectly reasonable things to ask for. And then very finally, we need access to individual patient data. Now, it's only really this that poses any serious privacy issues. Very occasionally in a clinical study report, you might get a one paragraph long description of an adverse event where you could argue that it was to a certain extent identifiable information about a patient. And I'm very happy for that to be available only on request. And there's a long history in medicine of, of people making this kind of information available on request. And there are lots of services available to manage that already. Individual patient data does present privacy issues with every single release, but these are not insurmountable barriers. In fact, they have been surmounted for several decades. The first ever individual patient data meta-analysis that I'm aware of was published in 1970. It's on aspirin. So this is a problem that we've been fixing for over four decades now. And if you look at the work of the Early Breast Cancer Collaborative Trialist Group, for example, individual patient data meta-analysis is absolutely commonplace. It's a very straightforward thing to share this data without there being serious concerns about privacy. Furthermore, observational epidemiology, where we work on large electronic health record data sets to look at associations between environmental exposures, for example, and disease outcomes, 
The entirety of that is done on individual patient data that is released on request to people who are sensible and can demonstrate that they're capable of analyzing it and capable of protecting it. So these are not insurmountable problems. These are problems that are surmounted a thousand times a day in universities around the world. Lastly, I think it's important to recognize how long have I been talking for and when should I stop? Just to oh, no! Just finish your sentence. My or sentence? Or Okay, look, firstly, it's, it's not enough just for regulators to see this stuff, okay? Regulators miss things. If we look at Vioxx, rosiglitazone, diabetes drug, Avandia, if we look at problems with the evidence for Tamiflu, that was missed by regulators. And that's not because they're thick. They are highly intelligent, highly trained, well-motivated people. But they're not perfect. And these are difficult problems to spot. And it takes many eyes. And the whole principle of science, the whole foundation of science is that we have transparency. We have access to your methods and results. The Royal Society, the oldest scientific establishment in the world, big motto like the Boy Scouts, above the door, carved in stone, nullius in verba, on the word of no one. Because in science, we don't care how many white coats you wear. We don't care if you're a professor or how many letters you have after your name. We want to see the methods and results of your study, and then we can make an informed decision about whether we believe the outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, ben Goldacre will have plenty of time after that in the uh, debate, of course, to return to some of the specifics of what you just mentioned. Uh, let me turn now to Guido Razi from the European Medicines Agency. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. And uh, let me uh, thank Mrs. O'Reilly for uh, this invitation to this seminar that's uh, given me the opportunity to explain uh, the, the European Medicine Agency draft policy uh, on the transparency of clinical trial data. And um, I'm really looking forward to this meeting, this discussion, to, since we really are committed to capture and to get any possible further suggestion and help that might help. Um, in the next five minutes, I just will give an overlook, an overview on the, uh, where we are and what are the next steps. Well, in 2011, we uh, experienced a tremendous increase in access to document. Therefore, in 2012, we decided to go for a, to explore the possibility of a, a proactive um, access to those clinical trial data. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, while there was not and there is not today any legal obligation for us to develop such a policy, we still believe, we felt that there was and there is now in the interest of the public health to improve, to explain the way we are uh, taking our decision. That's why we, we had two, two goals in mind in, at that time. One was to increase the transparency of our recommendation and to allow for public scrutiny to increase. That's the only way to increase the trust in the decision we are taking. And second, to allow researchers to use existing data. That's to contribute to avoid uh, duplication of clinical trial and ultimately to foster new ideas and new research. So what we are talking exactly, are, it's about the um, clinical data that EMA receives from pharmaceutical company in support of a market authorization application. So we started in 2012 with a, a big meeting where all possible stakeholders, all the possible concerned people has been involved. Many of you were there. And the participants were very eager to contribute and to help us to find a, a way to, to, to address each one need and concern. So following that meeting, we established five groups. Uh, 200 people has been engaged from January to April. And with their advice, we've been able to draft our first tentative policy. And that was released for a public consultation for three months, as is uh, our usual uh, practice. And the consultation gave everybody the right to have a say. 
And in fact, in 90 days, we received 1,100 comments from 170 entities. And you can imagine from every possible part, including HTA bodies, regulatory, patient group, uh, individual patient, industry, and so far and so on. Most of the comments were in support of what was our proposal. However, there has been a strong call, for example, to protect the patient identity or to protect the company uh, from an unfair commercial use of that. So we, we have been facing conflicting views on that. To strike that balance, we needed to have uh, uh, to launch a final round of targeted consultation with key stakeholders, and that was in May. So where we are now, in June, we proposed to our management board to approve the policy. In principle, they agreed, but many board members raised the question about uh, a series of technical and legal issues and asked us to, to go back and to, and to adjust to meet their requirement. Also, we received some complaints from uh, researchers, from academy, complaining that our proposal on SKU view only was not enabling them to uh, really reanalyze data. And to address that concern, I personally um, proposed a substantial change, and now the new version allows for those who are interested in science and not in commercial use, to see, to watch, to download, and to print, and to use the data with the best of their uh, knowledge and contribution for the, uh, for the truth. For so while we strongly believe that clinical uh, trial data in general do not contain any confidential information, we know, we know that there are some exceptional cases Therefore, the new policy will spell out clearly what are the reduction principles to guide the industry. But remember that the final decision stays in EMA. Clear? Now, what we expect, that the management board next Thursday will approve this new version of the policy. That will give us, for the starting of 2015, the possibility to start proactively to publish this data, to make this data available, which might start end, uh, at the middle of 2016 to have the first uh, clinical trial report available. And this is very important because this will consent to cover the gap between now and the uh, new legislation that has been addressed today which will come into force in, in middle 2016, having the first available report, hopefully in 2019, but most likely in 2012. So without this policy, we will have a gap of five years. And, and we have no legal basis other than this policy. Okay, now to conclude, I truly believe that today transparency is not an option, it's a must. And I started with we are going to see not if to release the data, but uh, uh, how to release the data. We are setting new standards for transparency, and we are very proud that we kick-started the debate on transparency together with many of you. We succeed, we will be the first entity worldwide to allow free access to clinical data. And let me conclude that this process is not yet finished. And uh, together with all of you, we, I, we will be able to further improve and adapt the policy as we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guido Razi. I'm sure there will be lots of questions, of course, about the fine detail of this transparency policy because, as Ben Goldacre mentioned, the devil is in the detail. Uh, Richard Bergstrom, let me turn to you now as our last uh, speaker from uh, the... Uh, uh, the farmer industry, which obviously has high stakes in this whole debate. I, I actually asked for permission to show a few slides, particularly because I want to remind everyone about what was 
adopted by the European Parliament and Council. What does the text actually say? Because sometimes this lingering ongoing debate seems to lose the fact that things may have been settled already. Uh, but first, just to remind us all that, um, you can look here, uh, that remind us all that data sharing is already happening big time, but in a selective way. So my companies are involved in unprecedented partnerships with other companies and with academics in sharing research, uh, sharing, um, research results. Uh, we have the world's largest public-private partnership in life science here in Europe between my organization and the European Commission. The Innovative, Me Innovative Medicines Initiative, which was part of FP7, is worth 2 billion euros, 1 billion euro of in-kind resources from us, 1 billion euro from the Commission, not going to my companies, but going to academics. So we share in all these projects, we share data big time. But it is selective, of course. It's not with everyone. It's with those people that want to share with one another. This IMI program is now extended under Horizon 2020 with another 3.3 billion euros in the, same, in the same manner. Now we come to the next phase, which is to share data also with other people and with people uh, in civil society and independent researchers. Now, at times this discussion has been a little bit confused because there have been a number of things going on at the same time and we mix concepts. I know that after having worked on this for more than a year in the parliament, you know very well the different terms, but I still run, run into many people that don't see the difference between a study report and the underlying data sets, which are in electronic format, okay? There have been three, three, there are three processes underway. The first one is clinical trial regulation, which is now being implemented, and it's going to take a few years before it's fully in, in place. There is uh, what Guy Rassi described, the, the proactive uh, publication process that EMA is going to put, put in place. Uh, and then there is the industry commitment. We have faced up to these calls from society and agreed with our global partners on a global set of principles that our companies will actually give data, give study reports and full data sets to researchers. We committed to do this uh, be beginning this year and it's already up and working. On the left hand side here you see one uh, consortia where 12 of my companies have joined. They have already reviewed 60 requests. None of them have been turned down for scientific reasons yet. Three are subject to uh, clarification. All the others have been accepted. It's completely independently reviewed. There's an ac academic um, 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 expert panel reviewing the merits of the scientific questions. The second one described here um, to the right, um, mentioned in the Annals of Internal Medicine, is the so-called JODA program, which is run by Yale and where one of my member companies, Janssen, part of J&J, &J, have signed up and more companies are joining. We're not there yet, okay? This is in the early days, but we are really moving on sharing data as we have promised. Now, there is a big difference between study reports, um, as, as, as Ben Goldberg mentioned. The study reports have some, of, of some interest, but what's really interesting for researchers is to get hold of analyzable individual patient-level data, the so-called raw data in electronic format. And if you want that, you have to go to the industry because it's only we that have, have the data. And particularly if you want it formatted in the way you want, and you may want to do a meta-analysis across different companies' data sets. That's also a reason why we think that this is best done by the industry. The EMA has got other things to work on. They should challenge us and scrutinize our, scrutinize our products. But if researchers want data, they should come to the industry. We are on, we are on the way to build these systems. And there's still many open question marks about standards, how do we protect, protect uh, patients if raw data is going to be uh, shared with other people? I just want to finish with, with reminding ourselves about what the Parliament and Council actually decided on. Okay? First, it was it's said in the recitals that in general, data included in, in, included in, in study reports should not be considered commercial confidential. Guido Rassi said this as well uh, with a view to his own the applications that they've received at the agency. We agree with this. This means that maybe 90, 95% of the information, or even more, for some products it could be 100% of the information, is actually not confidential, not commercially confidential. What the Parliament and Council also decided on was that there is a, a method to actually redact certain information and protect commercially confidential information. It's in the text that there is a possibility. So I get a little bit confused when, when I still hear in the public debate, and I still hear members of the European Parliament saying that everything should be given to everyone. But actually, that's not what they decided on, 
right? So now we need to figure out how do these provisions work, and you may need to have some use controls. You may want to have people to, particularly if they get raw data sets, to actually sign a piece of paper saying, I'm not going to go commercialize this. Of course, you need to learn from the information. But we don't have the safeguards in all countries around the world as we have in the European Union. The regulatory data protection is not as good. Patents are not enforced everywhere. We need to have safeguards to protect the commercial rights of the, of, of the companies as well. So what I'm saying here is that we already gave in. Okay? Court cases withdrawn. It's happening. Let's move on and let's make this work. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, we can now open the floor to, uh, to questions and, uh, and remarks. I know there are lots of specialists in the room, so don't hesitate to raise your hand and, uh, and make remarks of your own or ask a question. And while you're uh, waiting, let me start with the opening one, uh, if you will, which would be uh, to ask all of our panelists here today whether, very briefly, they think the new regulation, the new cl clinical trials regulation actually um, you know, is a major step forward in your view as to transparency or do you see major shortcomings? Um, who wants to start? Ben Goldacre, maybe? Well, I think it's a valuable step forward and I wouldn't want to be unkind about its shortcomings because people had to fight so hard to get it, um, but it has enormous holes. Let's remember, first of all, that it really does nothing to deliver results on trials that have already been conducted, which are on the medicines that we use today. Uh, I don't know how many doctors there are in the room, but I don't think you could find any doctor in the world who only prescribes medicines that came on the market in the last 12 months, or even the last five years. We prescribe the medicines that came on the market in the past five, 10, 15, and 20 years. And because those are the treatments that we're using, those are the treatments for which we need full access to all of the trials. Now, what is striking now is that if you say to industry, I would like access to this trial from even eight years ago, they will tell you, oh, I'm, you know, you have to be realistic. Let's look to the future. Of course, you know, our document retention policies, it's very difficult for us to find this information from eight years ago. Now, the reason why that's particularly problematic is it's been over 22 years now that the pharmaceutical industry, through its representative bodies, has been promising that it is just about to deliver full transparency on all clinical trials. So 22 years of promising that, but if we ask for a trial from even eight years ago, we're told that it's not acceptable, that, that it's not accessible. I, I, I don't think that's reasonable. And I think actually that's one reason why, and I hope we can come back to the issue of individual patient data. That's one reason why I think we need uh, an archive for all of the data and all of the CSRs that are currently available held under lock and key while we continue to argue about who should have access and how because we need to stop more information being lost while we have that discussion. So uh, Richard Backstrom, let me turn to you maybe on this specific point about the historic data. Um, can you maybe respond? Um, first, it was only last year that we promised to give full data sets to people, okay? So but methods and results for 22 years have been promised and not delivered. We promised 10, 12 years ago to post within three weeks of starting a trial information that we've started it. Subsequently, this became US law, but it, it was preceded by a voluntary commitment. <coughs> industry. That works. Uh, secondly, we promised to give summary results uh, after study completion. Okay, and now a recent survey done in the, in the UK, which isn't published, uh, shows a 90% compliance over the last two-year period, okay? So we've delivered on that. Okay, it took a long time to get there, Ben. I agree with that. The new commitment is for full data sets and full study reports, okay? And that's being delivered on already, and we see traction. We've just done a survey. I didn't want to show the results here. Done a survey where a majority also of non-industry people taking part in this debate uh, see movement from the industry, okay? So we're working on it. As to historical data, more than half of my companies go beyond the principles that we've established. So what I have to do, I'm managing a, a complex member organization, is that we agree on some baseline. Right? And that baseline is that we do this commitment for, for the future, okay? Beginning this year. But more than half of my companies have said that they will also provide information historically, and, and several of them are working on this. I'm sympathetic to this, 
I'm sympathetic to this, and my companies are sympathetic. But, you know, we have to build this slowly. I think that if we could get from civil society over the next year or so a wish list, because we can't go back and open this up for thousands and thousands of compounds, okay? But if there are particular products which are contentious, where there is a debate, you know, I am sure that my companies would deliver for those. And I'm happy to be brokering such, such a, 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 an understanding, Ben. Okay, that's some kind of bold uh, commitment there. Uh, Emily O'Reilly, do you want to say a word about uh, your thoughts on the new regulation? Uh, well, I, I agree with, with, with Ben. I mean, obviously it, it was hard fought for, and I, I, I do recall that there was a, a great welcome uh, given to it um, when, when it emerged. Obviously, the, the issue is around the historical data and the historical trials, because I think um, the public just want to know about, about medicines, and they don't particularly care when, when they were produced, and uh, they have an interest in, in finding about all of them that, that may be relevant. I suppose what, what's of interest as well is, is in relation to Emma's new proactive transparency policy and, and it, as to whether um, the parameters that, that it decides on the degree to which they are going to feed into the future release policy in relation to the regulation. And there were a number of things that Mr. Rassi <coughs> raised. Um, he talked about guarding against unfair commercial use, uh, dangers around personal information, and he talked about that the information being released to those who are interested in science and not in commercial use. Uh, he talked about some exceptional cases. So I think when people talk about the devil being in the detail, I think it's in, it's in that particular area that we, we need to, need know, to know more about the detail. Margaret Ogan, you've been uh, involved in the design of this new regulation. So what are your thoughts about what it brings? What, what are the, uh, the transparency uh, advances? Well, the devil is also in the but. We are in favor of transparency, but. We are in favor of that, that but. And, uh, you know, it's so, not so difficult to hear when you hear this presentation, especially not sitting next to, not the devil, but the but. <laughs> the but. You know, because you can hear the whole moral approach is, is extreme. Uh, here you are talking as if you're just talking money. And we have two money sides. You know, it's patients and it's all of it public paid. It's our money. It's your money. It's our taxpayers' money. And just to say, what are we dealing with here? And hearing about that now, the whole, the whole gang is closely approaching decent life, but it will take another 20 years. And nobody stopped them to go there directly. If decent industry really wants to behave decent, I remember what our exemptions, that was personal information, of course, if you I could identify the patient. And uh, no, no, no business uh, was uh, money-making. Uh, I know that they were there immediately uh, claiming that their money were more important than our, uh, our citizens' health and our public budget money. We heard it immediately. But, uh, and the fight is, as you can hear now already here, is far from over, as long as the whole approach here is that it's legal to hide also, which happens again and again, uh, well, uh, information about non-effective non, non medicine or even damaging medicine, and uh, we have seen it. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I really hope that we, also within the pharmaceutical industry, as we have seen in some other areas, will get a split. So we have the good industries who are really fighting for having all the best conditions so that the best have also a chance and not only uh, the biggest. Right, let me turn down to questions from the floor. So there was one hand raised here. Can you please introduce yourself and say whether you're directing the question to anyone in particular or to the whole panel? Thank you, Simon. My name is Natalie Moll, and I work for the European Biotech Industry Association, Europe for Bio. Uh, my question is for Guido Razzi. First of all, I'd like to use an and and not a but word. Uh, um, Europe for Bio, the biotech industry, supports the increase um, towards more transparency, and uh, we believe it's very important as an, in, as an association impacted by three agencies, not only EMA but also EFSA and ECHA, 
that the three agencies try to work as predictably and consistently as possible in terms of transparency. And as such, we've, signed, uh, we've developed some transparency principles with the chemical industry, with the pharmaceutical industry, and with the crop protection industry to say how we believe a um, consistent approach by the agencies will facilitate uh, transparency. My there are two parts to my question. Um, the first part regards patient data. Um, very often with biotech related trials uh, are carried out on small populations, perhaps often, uh, often uh, diseases. And I'd like to uh, know from um, Professor Razi how the agency intends to ensure that the data of those patients is kept as confidential as possible, what kind of safeguards are in place because it's often quite easy with a very small population uh, with a very specific cl clinical profile to uh, r reach really more information about the patient. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, we, we heard about um, your commitment, Professor Razi, to ensure the data is now also downloadable and printable. Um, I think the concern mainly is that the data is used in other geographies and submitted for approval without um, proper scrutiny. So given that obviously this possibility is now enshrined in the draft um, policy, industry is very concerned. How, how are there any plans to uh, make sure that uh, this policy is implemented in such a way to limit any attempt of misusing the information and in other geographies and, and submitting it for regulatory approval? Thank you. Good. Um, I saw there were other, ra uh, other hands raised, so I'll try and group the questions. There was a gentleman at the front. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Jan Lecam. I represent the European Organization for Rare Diseases, and we are involved since about 15 years in different scientific activities of EMA for rare diseases. And the first thing I'd like to say is to say that we're highly satisfied with the synthesis that the European Medicine Agency has reached based on the large public consultation. There were really very diverging views, and it was very difficult to find a way. And what is being proposed, we think, address the specific issue uh, in order to allow independent reanalysis of data. Because we're going to have, at the end, maybe only 1%, maximum 5% of the clinical study report, which will not be accessible. So let's see already, with this 99% or 95%, what we have and what kind of issue we, ha we have. Because we may also have issues of reassessment which may undermine the trust into the system because they are ju just crops, external studies. There would be excellent studies, but there would be also crops. So that will undermine the trust and also of, of the patients of can they take that drug, can they not take it. The, on this policy, the, the screen mode uh, only information for academic researchers who wants to do meta-analysis, we think it's, it's, it's good enough. Okay, maybe they cannot manipulate the data so easily and they have to use their pen and their computer to use this downloadable and printable data, but they can still do it. I mean, it's not Stone Age to do that and it does protect the patients with regards to what they have consent in their informed consent. They gave an authorization for a certain use of data. We don't want that to be abused. We feel that there is more work which is needed for the reflection and legal clarification on individual patients' rights, uh, but to go in two steps. First, releasing the data from clinical study reports, as it will be now, and then defining a different procedure for accessing the individual patients' data. And on that, there is one particular area, which are the adverse effects in pharmacovigil and, and also in pharmacovigilance, where we would like to have really a full open access and we don't see that there is commercially confidential information in that. So we need to more into that if it's clear. It's not fully clear to us yet. Now, to, I'd like to add two concluding elements. One is that I'm quite shocked, to be honest, when I listen to you, Mrs. Oaken. You are an MEP, member of European Parliament. You represent citizens, and I'm sure that you're trying your best in order to defend public interest. Now, when I hear to you, and knowing the subject, I don't feel that my interest is being represented. Why? Because you're presenting with all good faith very general statement. But life in this situation is not black and white. It needs to be a little bit more refined. And there is a fine line to draw in order to protect the interest of everyone while serving public interest. And 
I believe there is one thing which is extremely important, is that this policy of the European Medicine Agency has been developed with a group of 24 patients' organizations and consumer groups who apply and are adopted to form a group of work at the European Medicine Agency, and they have elaborated that. And these are the people, the patients and the consumers, which are probably the most concerned about these issues. So use their analysis, consult with them, and I'm sure that will help you tremendously. And the last comment is that I think we should not only focus on this open access data. The issue we want to address is to increase the trust in decision making, and there is other ways to ensure that transparency. Just to mention two, the larger involvement of experts into the risk-benefit assessment beyond what is being done and the involvement of patients' representatives in this assessment of benefit-risk is really a very interesting way to increase trust. It's not only access to billions of data, which what do you do as a patient with that? And second is to maybe accelerate the agenda on public hearings. Having public hearings with all stakeholders will tremendously increase the trust because that will be an opportunity to have access to the data, to some of the data, and to the draft reports, and to discuss it openly at the time that the decision is being shaped. Thank you. All right, and I saw there was another question just behind you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ilaria Passerani from BEUC, the European Consumer Organization. I have a short question to all the panelists. The EU position on pharmaceuticals in the context of the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, TTIP, refers to an harmonized definition of commercial confidentiality across sectors and also specific confidentiality provisions in the sector of pharmaceuticals. So I'd like to ask you if you think that uh, the broad definition of commercial confidentiality in the U.S. will have an impact on what we are discussing here today and on the progress made so far in the European Union on clinical trials transparency. Thank you. Good. I think we can, uh, we'll start with those three. I see the other hands raised. I'll take a second round after that. Uh, so let's start with the, uh, the patient safeguards in uh, the European Medicines uh, Agency and the point that was raised about the small populations of, of, of patients which can easily be identified. Is that at all something um, that you feel has been addressed? <clears throat> yes, I, I think the, the small group of patients in the first step is addressed because uh, now we are going to release only the CSR where we don't think there is much of the risk of that. Um, meanwhile, in the next step, where we will be going the individual patient data level, that will be uh, certainly a, a challenge how to protect, uh, especially those small groups. Um, we have to, to, to look both for technical new solution, uh, basically IT solutions, uh, but we at the um, European Med Medicine Agency, we are enjoying uh, a very large collaboration and involvement of patients. And uh, that's it's something for them to have the last say how we can uh, really be on the safe side to protect the, the, the individual patient data. And uh, uh, in some cases, as have been said, uh, it can be that... Uh, uh, we have to obtain the, 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 the consensus of the patient to, to release some data for the sake of uh, science and for the sake of transparency. Uh, that is the next step, and that's why I'm eager to start, because, uh, as I say, there is a process that is not completed. Ildeka, you seem to want to uh, react to this. So, sorry. I just think it's extraordinary to see this sudden interest from industry and various patient groups in preserving confidentiality and protecting individual patient data. Um, and I would remind you of the front page story in The Guardian, the full text available online of the leaked memo from Pharma, from Pharma and FPA to senior members of their membership bodies stating under the heading advocacy strategy and these are their words, that they will mobilize patient groups to raise concerns about re-identification of patients from individual patient data. 
So we should be in no doubt that this is a rhetorical strategy designed to slow progress of sharing individual patient data. Now, having said that, I am not just a believer in close controls over access to individual patient data. I'm a campaigner for it. I stand on the, on the advisory group for the electronic health records um, new electronic health record sharing system in the UK, care.data. I've written two major articles in the newspapers over the past year arguing against freer sharing. So I think it's an issue, but when the gentleman at the front from the, from the Rare Diseases Association, a, a group of people who incidentally, I think, probably have more to benefit from greater sharing and in particular reuse of previously licensed and even rejected compounds than almost any other group of patients. When he says the devil is in the detail, I absolutely agree. And I see, I, I, I see no reason to believe that suddenly all of the systems that have been used for protecting identity when sharing individual patient data, data for, for four decades now will suddenly break down just because we're sharing some slightly different individual patient data from industry-funded trials. I don't believe that anybody in this room could give me a single example of a medical researcher maliciously re-identifying an individual. I don't believe that anybody in this room could give me a single example of a medical researcher leaking identifiable medical data to the public. I think that this is more about rhetoric than it is about reality. And when we talk about consent forms, this is another very interesting piece of detail. Because consent forms, people say, oh, well, you know, people, patients give their consent for only a tiny number of people to work on the data. Firstly, I think the spirit in which people sign consent forms, and if you look at the evidence on what people understand when they sign them, they're very confusing, very long legalistic documents, and essentially people often sign them blind. But if you look at, the, if you look at patients' intent, patients' intent is I'm participating in a trial for the greater good of patients like me in the future, for the greater good of humanity. And secondly, I find it very hard to believe that there really is legal wording in a consent form that allows such a huge number of people to work on trial data. A, a statistician employed by the company, an external statistician, an academic consultant, somebody working for a, a, a CRO, perhaps a, an independent academic collaborator, perhaps somebody from a marketing department, perhaps an external regulatory consultant. All of these different people can have access to the data, but somehow an academic wanting to do an individual patient data meta-analysis would be excluded. Well, I would very much like to see the wording on those consent forms that excludes that. And when I say I'd very much like to see that wording, I'm running a project at the moment where we are asking companies to give us the consent forms so that we can look at that wording. And we've already begun to have refusals. So people are refusing to show us the consent forms, which they claim are the reason why individual patient data cannot be shared. Richard Bergstrom, the uh, protection of individual data. So is it rhetoric or reality? No, it's reality, but it's doable. You know, we do this all the time in these consortia, this IMI program. They've just developed last year or earlier this year a, 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 a standards for how you do this. You may have to do sort of double anonymization and scrambling and encryption and, and, and some data you actually distort slightly, you know. Uh, uh, you don't have to say 42-year-old wom woman living somewhere. You can say 40 to 45, and you know, suddenly it becomes more difficult, you know. So there are tools here. And Transcelerate is another big program where companies are collaborating with academics, and they've just published a few weeks ago, actually, um, also standards. So this is doable, but the, this is these, the devil is in the detail discussion, you know. It's, it's not rhetoric. There is a serious intent from the side of the industry to open up and to share this information, but it has to be done properly, you know. Um, so so I, 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 I think it's doable, it's doable. Um, and EMA will have to figure out how to do it to the extent that you have that individual patient level data if that's, re if that's uh, uh, um, uh, requested. As to um, Ilaria's question on, on, the, on the transatlantic uh, uh, trade negotiations, we have to keep in mind here that this has been going on for more than two years now, right? Which means that everybody was asked in Europe and in the US, what do you want in this agreement? So the industry positioning at that time was, of course, not where we are today. Right? So I think there are historical documents probably floating around still, you know, that one should take with a pinch of salt. The current position of the industry is very clear. We make these commitments, you know. We accept this clinical trial regulation text. I mean, who are we otherwise? We have to accept that. We will work with everyone to make it work, and we accept the, the, uh, the, 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 the draft guidance from the EMA. I haven't seen the latest version, though, but we were consulted extensively. We accept all of this. And that holds for both the U.S. side of the industry and the European industry. We have a completely aligned position on this. 
Yeah, Emily, you, you wanted to react. That's on TTIP. Uh, yeah, well, just react on, on two things. I mean, I think there does seem to be agreement that it should not be beyond the capacity of the pharmaceutical industry and Emma to protect people who need to be protected, and particularly in relation to patient uh, confidentiality. And, and I think um, it would be a pity if we went down a cul-de-sac in particular uh, in, in relation to an area which, which I think both gentlemen have agreed can be managed uh, and, and avoid the bigger issues. I mean, I think you know, what, what Ben mentioned earlier in relation to the number of clinical trials that, um, that, that are not published, then ones that are negative, uh, the ones that are positive have, have a greater percentage uh, chance of being published than the ones that are negative. I mean, he, he tells me that. I, um, I, I, I read that. Uh, the, the gentleman happened to dispute at that. If that is the case, I think that any, as I call them, ignorant lay people, including myself, want to know is will the new transparency policy and when the new regulation mean that, that every trial is potentially releasable and visible to people who need to see it? And I'd like to know, you know how those who are interested in science um, are defined. Um, in relation to TTIP, I mean, my office is obviously looking at that in relation to transparency uh, as well. Um, I am aware, as everybody is, that, that TTIP, of course, is taking an interest in, in, in this debate. I read a, uh, a study, a report that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce did in relation to the new regulation when they were flagging all sorts of, of issues and concerns about it. Uh, I think there is a great... Um, uh, um, uh, hunger for, for more transparency in relation to the uh, TTIP negotiations so that we can see exactly um, what the parameters of that debate are in relation to um, uh, clinical study trials uh, and, and uh, where, where the lines uh, are, being, uh, are being drawn. But uh, you're being very cautious. Are you actually worried that there could be a, a conflict uh, between the requirements that are being imposed as part of TTIP that could come into conflict with standards that we have here in Europe that would force us to lower those standards? Well, I mean, I'm surrounded by scientists here, and scientists work on, on the basis of evidence, and that's what I'll also um, uh, work on. Um, I'm, I'm aware that there are obviously concerns about it, uh, but until I see uh, evidence that those concerns are well-founded, then, um, then I, I won't make a judgment on it. But part of the work that I'm attempting to do is to ask all of those people, as part of a public consult consultation I'm doing in relation to TTIP, is to ask people who are concerned about the issues uh, to define their terms, to let me know what they feel is not being included uh, in the transparency uh, piece by the Commission and the Council, and to ask them what it is exactly um, they want to see. Just, just briefly, I'm very sorry I shocked you. Uh, we might not have met before. I'm a little bit direct, that's for sure. And uh, I might say clear that I cannot see a legitimate interest in keeping secrecy here. I cannot see it. Uh, and uh, except from what has been mentioned just in the final dis discussion here, very personal, personal information. And uh, we have fight that fight in clear language. And one of the things we want to know is also which money are behind what. Uh, that's why we have some skeptical sometimes who's sitting there when I hear about that in that organization. I always want to know who's behind it, who's paying, who benefits. That's part of transparency, and that creates, that creates uh, confidentiality. And I think we should everybody unite on that. And then, of course, there are, as Emily uh, rightly said, lots and lots of things that I don't know about. I'm just going for the political things here that I cannot see. Uh, uh, I couldn't defend uh, secrecy where we have uh, human health at risk or, we, or where we have, because it's part of this here, our health budgets. Because, sorry, uh, it's, it's an increasing, dramatically increasing uh, post on all, uh, all, uh, all public budgets. And we are talking with, on public money here in all sides of this year. Also, who's financing your research? We are. To 50 percent, researchers are public educated. We are paying, uh, and that's why I'm not. You know, I, I think you are too slow uh, in, in uh, you know, going into this year. Getting the, you might be continuously shocked. I'm, you might find some medicines to help you there. Richard Bankstrom, you wanted to interject. Well, <clears throat> well, first, it is primarily the pharmaceutical industry who is funding research. Um, we spend 100 billion euros every year. The EU spends 15. 
yeah, plus much. one in Brussels, okay? Now NIH spends 35. Now, I don't dispute the fact that at the end of the day, when medicines come to the market, there are taxpayers or insurance schemes that actually pay for the innovation. But you only pay for the successes, okay? You don't pay for the failures. Education is paid now, by us. Now, uh, on, on the issue of conflicts of interest, what we also decided last year, which is not maybe the subject of, of this conference, but I think it's very interesting for you, is that we decided to uh, introduce full transparency of all our financial relationships with healthcare professionals in Europe. There's already full transparency of support for patient organizations, but we don't, we're not transparent today about support to medical associations or other groups or clinics or donations and grants or consultancy agreements or traveling to congresses. So in 2015, we're going to collect all this information and beginning 2016, all my companies will have on their websites names and numbers, you know, individuals, institutions, and exactly what type of support they will, they will get. This is meant to really complement you know, the strict safeguards for instance, the EMA conflict of interest policy. Now we're, now we're going to match that transparency on the other side. And I hope, I hope we, 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 uh, we um, uh, will we'll see a much, even more robust uh, management of conflicts of interest after that point. Ben Goldenko, yeah. I just wanted to say a brief word about, about the use, again, I think rhetorically, of promises that industry is sorting this out independently itself and that we don't need help from outside to do that. It's not just abstract or theoretical, the idea that delivery here may be incomplete. There's a very clear history of incomplete and poor delivery and then subsequent reversals. Pharma, in 2005, finally delivered what they've been promising for a very long time, a, a, a website called clinicalstudyresults.com, which they promised would have all of the results of all of the trials which had been conducted on all of the medicines that were being prescribed. It was never complete, but within half a decade it had disappeared off the internet, and a recent study published in a top five journal looked at the content and showed that half of what was there has now disappeared forever. It cannot be found anywhere else. So we cannot rely on these half fixes from industry where they say we're going to do it ourselves independently and we don't need any extra help. I think it's great as a stopgap, but I think it should be done whilst industry, if they wish to demonstrate true good faith, and I hope they do, it must be done as a stopgap, explicitly as a stopgap, whilst saying, and we are actively lobbying for universal disclosure by EMA of all trial data. And unfortunately, what we've seen is quite the opposite. We've seen industry actively lobbying against disclosure of trial data. Right, let me try and exhaust the questions that we've, have been asked already. And there was uh, one point about the EMA policy, and maybe I'm turning to you again, Ben Goldacre, on that. How satisfied are you with what's in the works um, with, with transparency on the EMA? And the second part of the question, uh, of the first question, was about the uh, downloadable, printable uh, reports which are made available to other geographies. I don't know who wants to answer that part of the question, but maybe Ben Goldacre on the EMA. Well, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of protecting intellectual property, and I, and, and I think it should be very straightforward to say you're not allowed to use the data that you've downloaded to apply for a marketing authorization in another country. I think that's a very simple thing to do. We should just do it. And in fact, people who have poured over the legislation tell me we already have done it, but let's do it better. That's all absolutely fine. On the question of how, how confident am I in the new EMA proposals, I would say initially we were all very optimistic, but now we're very worried. And we're worried in particular because of one case, the Abvi case. Now, Richard Bergstrom from FPA, who I actually like a great deal, he is the best of the pharma industry representatives, um, he says, look, we gave in, court case is withdrawn, let's move on. Now, let's look at what actually happened with the Abvi case that has been dropped. A deal was cut with the European Medicines Agency where they would release redacted clinical study reports. Now amongst the redactions that we know of in these clinical study reports are included changes to the protocol made during the conduct of the trial. Now there is absolutely no reason I can think of that would make that a part of the, of the clinical study report that would contain identifiable patient information. I also can't imagine why there would be any commercially confidential information, and certainly not commercially confidential information, that would outweigh the benefits to public health and to patients of being able to see those protocol changes. 
If somebody changes what they're doing in their trial after they've begun, it's quite likely that that's because they've got a finding that they don't like and they are changing their trial so as to flatter the data. Now, I don't know that that's what's happened in this AbbVie trial, but that is in, uh, one of the most significant risks with a protocol change. And so that's why we want to see the protocol changes in the AbbVie document. That's why we're concerned that EMA have redacted it. And I'd very much welcome, a, if, a, if any view can be given, um, I'd very much welcome an explanation of why even protocol changes have been redacted from this clinical study report. But more than that, I think that sends a very worrying signal about what will be done with proactive release. Because if people are redacting protocol changes, something as simple as that, something as simple as what was done in the trial, then I think that's a very bad signal for what's going to happen in the future when clinical study reports begin to be released, God willing, within the next year and a half. Guido Razi. Yes. Uh, I start from the last, from, from the AbbVie case. Um, that, I think, is uh, something that on the, on the opposite has to be reassuring everybody. And that, uh, I think, we succeeded in two years to have uh, the ABVI coming back to MA, accepting what two years before we are not keen to accept. They accepted 90% of what we were willing to release. And that's without any legal change, but the only change was our commitment to stand in what we think that should have been released. And I have to say that still one case is in the court because they will, are not willing to accept our way, and we are alone in that court. So I appreciate the support that everybody is giving. I appreciate this call that everybody supported us in taking the courage to issue a policy without having a legal basis. But remember that in court we go alone. Good. Um, I see many other hands being raised. Um, one here in the middle, two uh, women in the front. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is Jim Murray. I have a blog called Open Medicine EU. Um, two quick points, but connected to Mr. Razi and Mr. Bergstrom. Um, I appreciate the efforts that the EMA is making for transparency, but it's worth reminding ourselves that, in fact, the Commission decides. Uh, it is the Commission who must approve all policy on transparency for the agency. Looks like that will be DG Enterprise from now on, but uh, that's uh, and. That was why, six weeks after the end of the public consultation, the agency reported to the Commission on 27 different objections from the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry to the policy. Uh, there were six on confidentiality, three on clinical trials formats, seven on rules of engagement, four on analysis of results, seven on legal aspects. So there's a very strong uh, concern, I put it no more than that, within the industry, uh, about aspects of transparency, and that's why I turn to the code. 98% transparency isn't enough in this area, because the 2% may be exactly the amount of information that the particular company or the sponsor does not want you to know about. So that's, the, that's the point. And so will a voluntary code achieve that? I don't think so. What about information to clinicians that, uh, for example, um, that a particular medicine is not well supported by some groups? Will that be made available? Uh, information that would provide, would destroy any case for um, off-label prescribing? Will that come out? These are the issues that uh, are, are very important, and I don't think the code will meet those. First of all, it's voluntary. The national associations must sign up. Then individual companies must sign up. Individual companies must appoint a, a panel to supervise them. Uh, and then finally, at the very end of the day, somebody may apply for something. If they're not given it, what do they do? There's no effective redress in the code for this, and any redress there is there would take years anyway. But it's also the case that the information is to be shared only with those research, not with clinicians, and not with the bulk of scientists on medicines, 
which are scientists in the industry. Uh, and it is by sharing fully with all scientists that we're likely to get the best science in the end. But it seems to me, and I've read it very carefully, and I know a lot about voluntary codes, um, that the code, while I've no doubt of its good intentions, simply cannot work and cannot get at the nitty-gritty, at the 2%, at the information that, uh, that really a company does not want to disclose because it will cost a lot of money. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll get Rido Razi to react immediately on this one. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I don't know exactly what was the every single point uh, that uh, Abbey gave up. But I think that some fundamental principle, and then maybe I hand over to, to the person who has been dealing with more, more, close, more closely. The fundamental principle that we are now releasing clear criteria for reduction. The company has to issue a justification for what they are asking to reduce. And this for us the last say. If they disagree, still there is the court. And we demonstrated we don't we don't fear that. Uh, what can be there? We, we, we are thinking about some innovative bioassay, analytical methods, quality issue, manufacturer methodology. That's what we are thinking. Could be 2%, could be 5 could be 7 but we expect roughly 5%. What they disagree, uh, they disagree. We have the last say. I don't know if uh, maybe Noel Vation want to have some more details of what has been uh, uh, consented to be left on the, or, or, or there is no. Go ahead and maybe introduce yourself so that yes. everyone understands who you're speaking. Uh, my name is Noel Vation from the EMA. I'm the chief policy advisor. Uh, first, to come back to what Mr. Murray said, uh, this policy is under Article 80 of the regulation, which is an increase in transparency. Um, and Article 80 is very clear that it's the management board who adopts after agreement by the European Commission, so it's not the European Commission who decides, it's the management board who, who adopts. Uh, coming back to the issue about CCI, we have to take into account, and I'm going perhaps back to some of the other statements which have been made, Unfortunately, in the EU, we do not have a legal definition of CCI. Irrespective of the, of the fact that we have access to documents, we have regulation 1049, uh, nowhere it is spelled out what CCI means. So, and what we have been doing and within the regulatory authorities, jointly between the EMA and all the national competent authorities of the member states, we have tried to come up with a definition of CCI years ago in 2010, following 2010, when we saw the need in order to come to a common understanding, despite the fact that the legislator never provided any clear definition or that we never had a ruling of the European Court on this. So we had to work within a vacuum and we have learned from the experience and also the way we have applied CCI has of course progressed over time to where we currently are in relation to the, to the draft policy. The particular issue in relation to, to APFI, and uh, indeed, when you look at clinical development programs, we need to have a look at what is currently at stake. So what is being requested for the application which is being submitted? And where we would allow, for instance, if there are particular exploratory endpoints in relation to further developments of the product which is not imported for the benefit-risk discussion on the application at stake, then that would be, could be redacted provided that the company gives a justification. And there is always a possibility taking into account access to documents to ask for an overriding public interest where the requester can justify, where we can have a look again and then decide in the context of an overriding public interest to disclose. Okay, um, um, yeah, Bell Goldenko, you, you wanted to react and then I'll turn to you. Just very briefly, I mean, there's been a lot of talk, talk of, of process 
and this is the building of which people talk about process. Um, ultimately, we're told that when there are redactions in a clinical study report, the EMA will have the final word, and that is a black box, and it's a black box into which we cannot see. Now, I personally believe that Guido Rassi is an enormous force for good, and he's somebody that I trust. However, I'm not willing to give blind trust to that process for a number of reasons. Firstly, we know, and this is the subject of a, a new, very recent complaint to the European Ombudsman, that there were a series of meetings between representatives of the pharmaceutical industry and the EMA to campaign against transparency regulations, the contents of which are secret. Now, I, I think it's an unfortunate and ugly reality that we have secret meetings between lobbyists and elected politicians, but I'm very concerned to hear of secret meetings between lobbyists and statutory bodies, such as the European Medicines Agency. I do not have secret conversations with Guido Rassi. And secondly, I come back to this issue, and people have talked about detail. I think it's very important to look at detail. With the Humira clinical study reports, AbbVie have successfully argued that protocol changes should be hidden from doctors, from researchers, and patients. Now, I cannot see any reason why protocol changes should be withheld. I can see lots of good reasons that I've explained why they should be made publicly available. When I look at the very good breakdown of the ICHGCP standard structure of a clinical study report, which has been annotated by EMA in their draft proposals from 2013, they set out the different parts of a clinical study report. They say which parts uh, may even possibly contain commercially confidential or, or individual patient data, and the protocol changes is not listed among them, so that's one of the bits they say should be freely shared. What do I do? I, I am in a very difficult situation where I cannot understand why protocol changes on a clinical study report about Humira by AbbVie should possibly realistically be withheld from doctors, researchers, and patients. And where do I go with that thought? Where do I, where do I go for answers? Can, can you tell me why a protocol change should be removed from the public record? I think there is a little bit of misunderstanding. Uh, first, we had, as has been said, we have a, no real definition, no legal definition of clinical commercial information. So I might share with you any concern. I can basically agree with you. Still, I have to stay to what is the best of the interpretation toward the clinical transparency, toward the transparency. Second, if that if, is that, I have, have not been participating in that specific exercise. But if the principle is that this plan was a change that might be in favor, that the knowledge might be in favor of a competitor for an ongoing development, I think if was that the case, it might be, have been accepted. So even in principle, I stay with you with the protocol changes might be important and might be in, in the most of the cases important. On case by case, if a justification is issued, we can, under the current definition, stand. And, uh, and here I have two plea. Uh, why you are coming to EMA to ask these things when uh, conflict of interest and commercial confidential information is not for us to decide where we stay. We are law followers, not lawmakers. For example, I was suggesting three years ago for a Sunshine Act to help us. We are, we are not a police body for conflict of interest. A Sunshine Act like the one they have in the US will help us. But so far, everybody come to us to plead to do because I understand why you, try, you come to us because you trust us, basically. You think we are thinking the right thing but we don't have actually the possibility to go beyond some interpretation or beyond what is clearly set by the legislation. Emily, yeah. 
Just two things. First of all, um, we are looking at, at the um, discussions that, that took place between the, the Commission and Emma in, 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 in relation to, to these issues. And secondly, in relation to, to the court case that, that uh, has been much discussed here, um, this began before I, I, I was appointed, uh, elected as, as European Ombudsman, so I, I'll give you my uh, understanding of it and my colleague, Fergal O'Regan, whom I'm about to put on the spot, who, who has been uh, uh, overseeing this, we will correct anything that I'm wrong. But my understanding of it is, is that the, the American companies who took uh, uh, Emma to, uh, to court, or obviously were, were claiming there was commercially sensitive information in, in some of the, uh, uh, the records, the clinical trial, trial studies that were proposed to be released. And my understanding of it is that Emma began the case on the basis that there was nothing that was commercially confidential in the, uh, uh, in the records that were proposed to be released. And now, at, at the end of the day, there, there was a settlement. Uh, certain records were redacted. Uh, so presumably, something changed. Emma's mind was changed in, in relation to it, whatever. Um, and, and at the moment, um, we are examining those records to see whether uh, the contention that the, um, the information contained in, in the records was, was commercially uh, sensitive was, uh, was in fact the case. I mean, I take your point that there, there's no um, broad definition of it, but sometimes common sense can be a, a useful tool in, in determining these things as well. Sorry, could I ask Fergal if he just wants to add something there? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. Um, yes, Fergal O'Regan, Head of Unit with, with, with uh, the Ombudsman. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, I think for the first point that's worth making is the position taken by Abvi in the court case initially was that there was a general presumption that the entire clinical study report uh, was commercially confidential. Thankfully, that position um, uh, has moved on. Um, it moved on to a situation where Abvi... Uh, uh, um, reached a settlement, as mentioned by um, Emily O'Reilly, um, with Emma, that certain information um, is uh, commercially confidential. There is no question about the patient data, which right from the very beginning, everybody agrees, should be redacted to the extent that it identifies uh, patients. Uh, the issue is that the burden of proof is on the entity, be it Emma or the pharmaceutical company that in, uh, insists on certain reductions, to show, to demonstrate specifically that specific information, if released at this point in time, is commercially confidential. Those study reports date to 2006. It might be the case that at that point in time, certain information concerning ongoing developments at that point in time were confidential. We're examining whether or not that is still the case today because what counts is what happens if the information is released today. Um, we are looking at it in detail. We're going to send a series of questions, as Emily mentioned, uh, to Emma to precisely, as, as you say, the devil is in the detail here. We need to know precisely why every single redaction um, is justified, and we'll look at that uh, um, evidence when we have it. We've carried out a detailed inspection of the file. Uh, we'll look at the answers that we will, uh, to the questions that we will uh, pose to Emma. And uh, we'll, obviously, whatever position the Ombudsman takes then will be, will be, will be made public. If I understand correctly, in the absence of a clear definition of what uh, commercially confidential information is, it has to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis, but doesn't that make the process very cumbersome? Uh, well, first I want a clarification. It's not EMA that changed mind. It was Abby that changed mind. That has to be <laughs> clarified. Um, no, with our uh, new policy, we set very clear rules. So the very marginal ma uh, room for maneuver for the industry to, uh, to ask for reduction they have to come with a, a proposal of reduction with the justification that should be consistent with our uh, principles, and we have then to accept if that or not. So it will become a sort of automatic thing because of very few issues. Those, those principles is what I say, that uh, data protection, uh, individual patient data protection, and basically if there is 
some methodology I just mentioned, uh, bio, bioassay equivalence, uh, quality issues, or some ongoing protocol uh, design that uh, at that particular moment can, some competitor can benefit, but they have to show that if they convince us, which is not easy. Ben Goldacre, yeah. well, I, I, I think it's incorrect to say that Abvi changed their mind rather than EMA. There was a negotiation and EMA accepted Abvi's proposal that this material should be withheld from doctors, researchers and patients. So EMA have given their assent to this censorship. Now, we don't know what people are considering to be commercially confidential information, but I remember the last time I saw Richard Bergstrom was at a meeting set up by FPIA, again in Brussels, at which we saw, and this is all on video, anybody can go back and watch the archive, at which we saw the head of legal at ADVI argue in front of a room of 100 people that adverse event reports should be regarded as commercially confidential information. A, a statement so extraordinary, incidentally, that Hans-George Eichler, the medical director of the European Medicines Agency and an excellent man, stood up and said, I've been working in regulation for 20 years and I've never seen anything like this. So that is what is regarded by AbbVie as commercially confidential information. And in this negotiation, we have learned that commercially confidential, uh, commercial confidentiality has been used as the argument for censoring uh, a, an apparently normal and important part of a CSR to disclose, the, any protocol changes. So I think this is very, very, very problematic, and I think it's a very, very bad indicator for what is to come with, with censorship of CSRs in the future. Richard Bergstrom. Yeah, but that study report finally was released, including safety information. So no, you should just declare changes. victory, protocol Ben. Changes. Just declare That's victory. No. Industry made a big U-turn here, okay? Can I see the protocol changes in the okay. Abbey Humira CSRs? You have to talk to Abby about that. Ask them. Ask the company. Under our commitment, you have the right to get data for, for research. Well, uh, to be absolutely clear, that would be excluded from your, um, from your uh, FPA expression of support for greater transparency because Abby and Humira, uh, sorry, Humira came on the market before 2013 is the cutoff. And so I, I, I can't ask them under the auspices of your promises. Have you, have you tried? Well, how far do you well, think, I think I you get should if start they're refusing to let EMA share it? I, I mean, let's be realistic here. There's a reason can why. I, can I comment right. on what was said before? Maybe we need to yeah. close this. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, but uh, the reason why the EMA has to redact things in the first place is because there's no control of the use. I mean, you know, I'm stating the obvious, okay? Because they put things on the internet, everybody can read it, which means that competitors can read it as well. The beauty with the industry commitment is that there will be no redactions. You get, if you qualify, you get the entire study report. But the difference is that we can have Ben Goldacre sign a paper. So, so that's the difference, and that's the beauty of the industry commitment, that we have to see this as a complementary action. The EMA can do certain things, which is going to be easy for everyone. You have to log in and read, whereas if you want the full data stuff, you have to come to the companies. Right, I think, I think we'll have to uh, stop it here and, and uh, on, on this particular part of the discussion. I think you'll just both uh, have to agree to disagree on this one. I see there were many other hands raised, including one uh, here at the front. Um, front, yeah. Thank you very much. Stepping back a bit from the AbV case, which I remember quite well, the meeting last year that uh, we had to express quite strongly against the fact that an adverse event could ever be considered a commercial confidential. Um, so as patients representative, we do not have a dogmatic positions. Um, we're only focused on the patient's interest, which is not always that easy to identify. It's not that black and white. As you very rightly said, uh, rare disease patients, which re represent 30 million patients only in the European Union, do have a keen interest in sharing data as much as possible. But we are in a very paradoxical situation because on the one hand, we do need a lot of data sharing. On the other hand, we also do need a lot of data protection. So we are in a very uncomfortable situation. 
which I think that, I mean, we have been trying to develop this position with all our membership, and we vary between positions that are very, very open with their data and board other groups that are very, very, um, uh, uh, how can I say, protective of, of their data. So for instance, especially now with all the genetic revolution and all the information of a genetic kind, um, when you are in a patient group with very, very few uh, patients, it is very, very easy to identify who you are. You just do a cross-cutting of a couple of databases and you can very easily identify who is the person uh, that the data is being circulated. Um, another issue right. is how, how good, what is the guarantee that we can have that some independent restudy of our data will be better or as good or as trustful as any other one. So it's very difficult to find the patient's uh, interest. All right, so that was more of a statement than a question. Uh, I think there was a lady there who was asking for the floor already a while ago. Yes. Um, yes, I'm Ancela Santos from Health Action International. So we think that the biggest misuse of clinical trial data is to withhold, withhold it from public scrutiny. And what I would like to see in the case of rare diseases is that we have a bit more of a technical debate on how can we um, share this data instead of using as an upfront excuse that we cannot share it because of um, data protection concerns. I mean, this is our position. And then, um, I mean, I agree with uh, what Ben Goldacre said, identification risks are being exaggerated. Um, and there are many that use the question of data protection uh, to protect commercial confidentiality. And I think when we talk about data protection, we also have to put uh, everything in, in, in the right context. Um, we think that the transparency of clinical trial data is very important to public health, so important that it cannot be left to self-regulation. We think that we cannot leave to companies to decide which data they disclose, to whom, when, and, and how, because they are in a situation of conflict of interest when they make these decisions. And it's quite scary, actually, as it, as it was said, to know that companies like Avi think that information on adverse drug reactions could be considered commercially confidential. We were quite pleased with the clinical trials regulation, but we think uh, we are still a long way to go until we get uh, full transparency of clinical trial data. And we would like to call upon the EU to continue working towards full disclosure of all clinical trial data, and now to implement the clinical trials regulation in a way that maximizes the public health interest. And this will be better done if, this, if the EMA is under SANCO and not under the DG that is responsible for, for protecting uh, commercial interests. Good. Um, I'll try and get as many of the questions and remarks on board as possible. I see the gentleman here has been asking for a while already. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's a little bit uh, far away. Uh, I'm Wim Wienchens. I am the devil, I'm uh, afraid, and even the devil in the black box. Since uh, you mentioned the management board of EMA, a black box, and I am member of the management board of EMA. Uh, uh, so sitting in that and hearing you, I'm also the, the devil. I have several identities. I am, since my birthday, a patient with several uh, diseases. Uh, I am, uh, ma many doctors several times have said to me, say farewell to your family and to everybody here, uh, but by circumstances, and maybe you can say it in all the details, details, I'm still living. I am the oldest man here in the room, so many young people I, uh, I see. Um, and I would stress to you, I am also, as an identity, I am a biochemist. Uh, I have uh, several steroids made, uh, steroids uh, who are hopefully uh, uh, eaten by some of uh, people in the in the world, and I must say I'm eating also a lot of medicines. And since I am so old, I can overview uh, 77 years uh, what is happening in the world. And I've been uh, several years ago many times here in Brussels. It's now a revival for me. I see some old friends, and I must really say. Uh, I am, uh, yeah, and now is my question to you. Please, please, please look 
on the progress in the world is going on with patients, with treatment of patients, the progress of changing protocols, please change each day protocols, because life is changing, circumstances are changing, and of course you must do it in good ways, but don't condemn changing of, uh, of protocols. And I must say that I am a warm uh, supporter of the uh, document which we will decide on next Thursday. And uh, yeah, my question is very general that please realize when you are going home, life is full uncertainties. And in my opinion, and I support the people who have said that, acceptable uncertainties we are searching for. And those acceptable, I would like to everybody here, and maybe a few of the panel can answer that, that an uncertainty is an uncertainty, is not uncertainty. And if you have a certainty, then even do you have discussed about the nine. I was involved with the Chernobyl and so on. My laboratory, I was managing director of a research institute. So please give a little bit broader dimension and I miss, and that is my concrete question on this right to know day. Where are the patients in the panel? Where are, no, patients, not patients, leading uh, All right, association. I think point well taken. Um, there were many other hands raised, so I will try and get more questions, the gentleman here and the gentleman there as well. Yes, we'll start with you. Yes, thank you very much. I represent the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue that um, is a voice of millions of consumers on both sides of the Atlantic. It's a key actor in the discussions of the transatlantic um, trade and investment partnership. And in fact, uh, our official position is of great concern that the EU-US discussions would mean a barrier and a limit to transparency and access to clinical data. And we have lots of documents to show that FBI is lobbying this direction. Just like the documents we have that FBI has promoted that patient groups fight against clinical trial um, transparency and use the issue of data protection. These, these documents have circulated around the net and been published publicly. And I have a few questions. First of all, on the, on the issue of the court case, what many people ask all around the Brussels community is, why would the EMA, when they're about to win a court case that effectively would establish the limits of commercial confidentiality would establish that public health does take precedence over certain aspects of commercial. Why, when they, the general advocate of the European Court of Justice thinks that's going forward, and the other case that's still standing, in fact, has been limited. It's not exactly on the same thing, and has been circumvented. It's not exactly. Why would they, when you're about to win a case, do you make an out-of-court agreement? Why do you make an out-of-court agreement when you're about to win a case? that could establish that precedence in favor of public health and would establish precedence in favor of the critical mass that's needed for scientific debate. Because what we're talking about, I think Ben and, and others have, have said it very well, we're talking about can we have an informed scientific debate, nothing is black and white of course, but an informed scientific debate without all of the data. Well, of course not. Of course we can't. We can't. And I think okay. this is pretty obvious. Now, I have a, one other question. The issue of the EMA, and this is a very concrete question, what are the specifics that researchers will have to sign in order to get this data? This non-disclosure thing, this, you can't publish, you can't use it, because one thing is commercial exploitation, which I could understand, you don't want that. Another thing entirely is not to be able to quote it anywhere in scientific articles. It means not to be able to use it here or there. This is very, very important. And I think in this whole debate, I think there's a tremendous fallacy. The, the fallacy that's used by the European Commission, which is kind of the empty chair at the end of this panel, 
They use the fallacy that this clinical data is protected by copyright when it is not. They, they quote in their letters sent to EMA, TRIPS agreements. There is no TRIP agreement. There is no authoritative jurisprudence nor authoritative um, position of the, of the World Health Organization or, or the WTO on this protection over public health of commercial confidentiality of, in the clinical trial reports. And so I'd like to know on what legal basis do you use this NDA and what are the specifics of what can and cannot be used by people who have access who have to sign this paper? And don't you think there is a scientific research chill, a chill that will inhibit people from doing, having real scientific debate by having to sign this paper? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for this rather long question. If you can try and make yours short, if you're asking a question to any one of the panelists. Yes, gentlemen here. Uh, um, my name is Alexis Clapin. I'm, I've been in uh, touch with uh, Mrs. Aurelie and Mr. Uh, Razi about the case uh, about the product called Avonex. Um, I lodged uh, a complaint because I did not get the uh, uh, clinical study reports. In fact, I asked for it. The EMA said that it was uh, in the archive and they could not find it. Then I called uh, the ombudsman. I finally got, got the document. And uh, in this document, the uh, sponsor lied to the EMA. This lie was seen by the FDA documents, which, which uh, the FDA is analyzing the uh, individual data. EMA is not. And in the FDA some, uh, uh, report, there was a, a clear demonstration that there was a lie in this, uh, in this document. And, uh, in fact, it was impossible to have a discussion about the bias of this study, which is published. You can uh, type uh, Avonex on my name. You will find uh, the, all the publications. And uh, uh, it's impossible to have a scientific discussion with you. I, uh, most of the time discussed with the uh, ombudsman who we were um, who could discuss the process was the process uh, really uh, good and it was good but the scientific matter was not good uh, I don't know if I must uh, precise the bias it's uh, when you take off from a placebo uh, study the uh, placebo patients who are going bad and the, uh, um, well, no, the placebo were, were going uh, uh, wrong and the uh, uh, very patient were going bad, it might induce a bias. And that's the case for the study and uh, almost 40% of the patients were taken off the analysis. So uh, it's uh, obviously something that was not seen during for the, when the Avenix case was first analyzed in the beginning, we provide you with the uh, demonstration of the bias, and nothing is done. So, uh, how can we trust that uh, you're transparent now? If, uh, when we bring you uh, uh, information that uh, show that you made a mistake and you don't change, I'm not the only one who say that. The uh, Cochrane, uh, um, Cochrane document has just said that uh, this project has had a negative. Uh, benefits risk ratio. Okay, thanks for that. We'll uh, address it later on. I'll take one last question. There was that lady at the back. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Noah Simon and I'm from Bee Life. And actually I have a completely different view because uh, we are talking about pharmaceuticals and I come from the phytopharmaceutical perspective. So I see here the debate is uh, well advanced uh, in comparison with uh, what is happening with the phytopharmaceuticals. Actually, the, the problem is exactly the same uh, for the transparency and access to, to data. It's exactly, exactly the same. Uh, but the debate is, uh, and the approach is really uh, years <laughs> away. So actually, my question to, to the ombudsman, uh, to Mrs. Arelli, is like if uh, you are going to work in order to get a, a harmony in the approach in all these uh, areas, no? so pharmaceuticals, phytopharmaceuticals, uh, uh, chemicals in general. Thank you very much. Okay, let's start uh, maybe going back to the first question 
um, about the TTIP again, the concern about watering down transparency requirement, um, the EMA out of court agreement, um, and the need for the researchers to sign specific documents, etc. Yep, thank you. Uh, now, about the TTIP, uh, I <coughs> welcome any, any information because we are excluded from all this uh, dialogue. And if uh, anybody sees that there is a, a danger to go back with transparency, we welcome uh, any support in that respect. Uh, I, I expect that uh, in the other side of the Atlantic, they think much differently from us in terms of transparency. So that that's a, is a, a theoretical concern that we have. A, about uh, the fact that we were about to win, that is good to know, but we, we, uh, with the AbbVie, um, how we can know that we were about to win? Uh, we are still in, uh, in a court with another company for exactly the same uh, cases, uh, claiming the same things. The difference is that here AbbVie accepted what was the basic principle of our proposal two years before. And you cannot stay if somebody say, okay, I give up, I accept what you say. There is no way that you can't go. Then you can we can discuss for ages the nitty gritty of uh, was uh, more or less, 1% more, 1% less. But when you accept the 90%, including the ADA reports that we never we heard from Bengal Dekker that uh, the reaction of anyone at EMA is that is not even to be said. It's clear that it was not a settlement, it was just a withdrawal because they decided to, to change, they changed their mind about what is transparent and what not. And to prove that, the interim moon is still in the court and we are eager to see what the court will decide. And meanwhile, we are in the, in the process to issue a policy that address exactly that. So I don't think it's worthwhile to, go, to keep going on, on this because we, if the I evidence could just say, is there. The, the basis of saying we're going to win is because the rejection of the interim measures asked for by AbbVie of the pharmaceutical industry to stop the disclosure was based was on a series both. of arguments given by the court which gave everyone the idea that the final ruling would have been very, very positive. Thank that's you. an interpretation that uh, I, I wish it was the right one, but we, we still have the, 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 the worst case there and, uh, and, and they're not accepting, that's why they're still there. Uh, about the, the term of use uh, for who for how researchers can use uh, our, uh, our data. Uh, first, we have a fundamental difference from industry. We don't ask for any plan to release our data. We just say if you are not using for commercial, you have to declare that you are not using for unfair commercial purposes because we might be in a difficult position if we don't take any measure for that. But I don't see any problem for anyone in good faith to subscribe a website and to download and to print and to use and to reuse the data by any way. This is what we are proposing. If you are in a bad faith, maybe you are a competitor, you might not be willing to present yourself and to, to say who you are and what you're doing. By the way, we are not asking the use. We are only asking to qualify and to sign, so it will be a breach of trust, a breach of terms, and you are taking the responsibility that they are not using for commercial use, so anybody else can use. What about the claim about that this would create some scientific chill? So you're saying this is, does not really apply? Can I, yeah, because I'm um, couple of things uh, maybe Noel can complement on this. Well, to come back to the, to the UPFI case, indeed uh, we won the appeal on interim measures 
and following that the company with, withdrew and it would be bad administrative practice when you go when you then continue at the level of, 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 the, of the court since one of the companies has withdrawn the application uh, also bear in mind that what we have been discussing was on the basis despite legal absence of a definition that we have uh, worked on an agreement within the regulatory network for years. That has been the basis for how to define CCI and how to apply it to all the uh, requests for access to documents and for the proactive pu publication. I want to come back then to, to the issue of Avonex. I do not know the specific case, but it is very uh, untrue in order to protect it in such a way that we are not willing to look at any negative data. We have a legal obligation to look at whatever data are coming, positive or negative. It doesn't matter where they come from, from a company or from an individual. Any secondary analysis which have been performed by Cochrane, etc., are being looked at by, by our scientific committees. It doesn't mean necessarily that they agree with the outcome of that secondary analysis, but then you can have a look at the rationale for that particular decision making. So whatever is happening in the outside world, we have a legal obligation to look. It is being looked at. It's being considered by our scientific committees, and we are transparent because you have the assessments done afterwards and being published. And that will continue also with this proactive publication policy. Okay, um, what are, um, sticking with EMA then, um, uh, the second question was about the specific uh, complaint about a clinical study report uh, from which uh, the document was not complete or there were some inaccuracies in there, right? No, in, in fact, the, the document that was used for the approval of the product was uh, uh, false and incomplete. And uh, uh, I tell EMA that this was the case, showing uh, that it was different from uh, what the, for example, the FDR was saying about the trial. And uh, I published an article on the bias of the trial and sent them. Uh, the Cochrane uh, uh, said that this product has a negative uh, um, uh, benefits risk ratio. And uh, I received a letter from EMA saying, well, uh, we have uh, seen with our expert, and they say that uh, it's okay, nothing had changed. So uh, the letter, I, if you want. Uh, and everything is, uh, uh, is over now because uh, it's not possible to have a scientific discussion with EMA if EMA says it's okay, we, don't, uh, uh, we, we, we disagree, and uh, that's all. Uh. Yeah, I, I think uh, has been addressed the, the, the reply. Uh, first, uh, it's always possible to have a scientific discussion with the MA. In fact, the case has been reconsidered. If the, our expert, we have seven committee, come to a conclusion there is, there is a matter for disagreement on something. If there are additional data and additional evidence, we will reconsider again and again. We have the pharmacovigilance, we have referrals, we have many ways to come back if we have taken a wrong decision. And that's why we want transparency to, to, to gather the best evidence any time it will be possible. So, Emilio O'Reilly, you were involved in this case. Uh, yeah, j just again in, in relation uh, to, to that gentleman's um, uh, claims in relation to the case and, and Emma's approach to it, I mean, I've certainly heard that interpretation put on it and I'm, I'm hopeful that once we examine the, um, the redacted documents and ask Emma uh, to clarify as to why they, they, they made those redactions that we will get a little more clarity in relation to this area. In relation to the comments from, from, from the gentleman to uh, my right, and, and he talks about the absence of, of patients' voices, well, we were very careful to bring uh, patients' groups here, and I suppose unless everybody on this panel is remarkably well, we are all patients, and uh, certainly we, we, we have a great um, interest in, in, um, in, in, in our own health and the, and the health of our, our families. You, talk, you say that there is um, a lack of certainty in life, and, uh, and of course that, that is the case. 
But I think when you strip away all the arguments that are being made in relation to data protection and this, that and the other, I think it, I think it comes down to something very simple, that we all have to be sure uh, that we are in um, possession of sufficient information on which to make informed choices uh, for ourselves and for our families in relation to the medicines that we take. And if we read or hear or become aware uh, that information is being withheld, that clinical negative clinical trial studies are being suppressed, um, mm -hmm. then, then that causes a problem. And not just for an individual, but generally for society in relation to, uh, to, to controlling diseases and so on. And I know I personally have made both positive and negative choices in relation to drugs or vaccines that my uh, children have taken based on, on, on what I have heard and read and not being absolutely certain that I'm getting the full story. So in that sense, you have your patients up here as well. In relation uh, to the case that that, that gentleman is, is talking about in, in, um, that, that has come uh, to my own office, I'd, I'd like to ask Fergal um, just to talk about that. Yes, I mean, of course, if uh, there is a complaint concerning access to documents and the documents are released, the Ombudsman considers that to be a success, that IMA has agreed uh, to um, uh, uh, comply with the request of, of the complainant. Of course, after that, the scientific debate, which results from transparency, that's an issue for uh, IMA to enter into a dialogue, for the scientific community to discuss. It's not for the Ombudsman to take any view on the specific science. Uh, the Ombudsman would consider that the success is the transparency, the creation of the, uh, the forum for that debate. So uh, we were very happy that that case was successfully resolved in terms of transparency so as to allow you to have that debate uh, with Emma, which is the, the end result which we're trying to achieve. Then it's a question of science for scientists to discuss having access to all of the relevant information. Um, uh, and uh, that's, uh, well, a debate that obviously would fall outside of uh, the, um, the competence of the Ombudsman, the scientific debate, yeah. Margaret, or can you want <coughs> to react? Yeah, well, not specifically to what was just said, but what Emily just said. When I hear this debate, it sounds as if it's just an, an ordinary conflict between commercial interests. Here we're talking about human health, and that was why we were quite strong in, in the Parliament, probably to some of you too strong, and insisting that, you know, this here belongs to humanity, this here belongs to the patients, and it's not. And that's why I get so confused when you are in doubt on how to define, for instance, CCI. That's once that's said, and then you said, Guido, well, we only do what we, what, what we can have a, what we have a legal basis for. Come on, who is now defining whether there's legal basis and when, the, when we are insecure? And that's why I feel that the whole issue on Abri was so depressing, because we, you had new laws in your new law in your hand, uh, which was we had the 2010 from the ombudsman, the previous ombudsman against EMA, and you applied, which we were very grateful for, and then we got this here on this this court case, and we were really, you know, it got so good answers in the second round, at least some I could understand that the industry. Commercial interest has to be defined for every, every single uh, file if it should be accepted, not just in general uh, confidential interest. And now we are ending up again in so many things exempted from what can be uh, accessible. And who can do it? Sorry, I think I, I, I'm too old to read, you know, I'm very bad with my memory. But this case on the entity receiver in UK, where it showed that the industry knew that it was developing suicide behavior, uh, teenagers, and it didn't work at all. It was a journalist from the BBC who discovered that. It was not one of these scientists. And that's why I think we should have accessibility for everybody. And come on, if there are competitors who get knowledge about and medicine being not valid or being not useful, that we have results here showing that this here doesn't work. It's good for all of us. It's good for all of us. And it's patent medicine, remember that. All the patents are in place. So it's patent medicine, but, but you know, I cannot understand. Yet I, I do understand why you don't need the troubles and you don't like this here. But it's good for me if competitors also know about the results of clinical trials. 
Ben Goldaker, you wanted to add something. Theme. There's a recurring theme here around completeness. People are saying, well, you know, we need to see the, the complete CSR, so we need to see protocol changes and so on. We need to see all of the trials rather than just the ones which people voluntarily elect to share with us because they're very likely to be a biased sub sample. I, I think we need to reflect on the extent to which the information that we have been discussing so far is incomplete. It's inevitable because we have the head of the European Medicines Agency on the panel, because we're sitting here in this building in Brussels, that we're thinking about access to documents that EMA hold. In some respects, I think it's actually slightly perverse that we're always hammering away at the EMA to get access to this stuff, but that's because we think that they're the people who are most likely to have patients' interests at heart. But let's think about how incomplete what they have themselves may be. The Cochrane Collaboration, when trying to do their systematic review of all of the trials ever conducted on Tamiflu, found that for about half of the trials which had been conducted, which they were able to identify, EMA held nothing. And for many, many more trials, what EMA held was incomplete. They only had certain portions of the clinical study report. Now, that's not an isolated case. By design, what EMA holds, what EMA has to share with us, will be incomplete. For example, EMA, of course, will not have clinical study reports from the era before EMA did central approval of drugs. So this will probably be most of the drugs for most of the prescriptions that are written by doctors all across Europe right now today. So Humira, Abvi, a tiny drop in the ocean of prescribing, this vast overwhelming majority, information that exists, information that is in dry document storage archives or on five and a quarter inch floppy disks, probably rapidly being shredded as we speak, but that information is not held by the European Medicines Agency at their buildings in London. By design, both EMA and, of course, all of the promises made by FPA and Pharma and all of the bodies, by design they exclude information about uses for which there is not a marketing authorization. Now that's a real problem because actually a very large proportion of the prescribing done by doctors like me is for use outside of the marketing authorization of a treatment. Many, many anti-epileptic drugs are also effective as mood stabilizers. Some of them have a, have a formal license for that use, but some of them do not and continue to be used on the basis of peer-reviewed, published academic data. It's a very reasonable thing to do to prescribe outside of the marketing authorization. The European Medicines Agency, of course, know that a very large portion of prescribing is done outside of the marketing authorization but they don't choose to share that information. They're not required to share that information. Nobody requires anybody to share that information. So then we end up with perverse situations, like, for example, duloxetine. The side effects of duloxetine, for the use for which it is marketed, that information from duloxetine trials is made available, but there is also side effects data from trials on duloxetine for a use for a different disease, a different condition, where they don't get marketing authorization, then that side effects information from those trials is not shared. Now, this is a perverse situation because if you have side effects from a treatment, it doesn't matter in which trial they happen to pop up. We need to have that side effects data. So I think we need to reflect on the fact that although we're persecuting EMA here today, they do not hold all of the information that we need. And we need to raise our ambition. We founded the All Trials campaign, and that means all the information on all of the trials conducted on all of the use of all of the treatments currently being prescribed. Right. Um, third question that we uh, had, and so I'm turning to that uh, one last one, was sort of widening the debate, Emily O'Reilly, and I think this one was directed to you. Um, is you're making all these efforts now focusing on the uh, openness and transparency in uh, the medicine, medical uh, sector. Uh, what about widening this to fitter pharma, but also more widely even to uh, chemicals? Um. Sorry. Uh, yes, and, and one of the things that just mentioned in, in my introduction that we are attempting to, to widen it to, to the main regulatory um, agencies, the Chemicals Agency, European Aviation Safety and, and the European Food Safety Agency, and this arose from um, an initiative from, from uh, the European Food Safety Agency to, uh, uh, to improve its, its transparency policy and, and to seek uh, public help in, in, in doing that. So what I have asked them to, um, 
uh, to let me what they are doing in order to improve their, their, their transparency. And, and yes, I mean, there, there should be harmony. Obviously, no one size fits all, but there should be certain, just very few principles that, uh, that um, are harmonized uh, across all of them. And out of curiosity, which ones do seem like they could improve the most? Uh, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm sufficiently new in this job not to have formed my own, my own views in relation uh, to them. Um, I mean, I'm impressed by the fact that the European Food Safety Agency is doing what it's doing. We, we, we look and see what the outcome of that is and then examine what the others are doing. I mean, I think, I mean, I think all of these are follow, follow an evolution. Uh, and I think um, certainly at, we're, we're at a point, um, certainly in the Parliament's history, when it's becoming... Uh, a lot more powerful um, and, and a lot more um, demanding uh, in relation to a number of issues, including, including transparency. I would imagine that a lot of the commissioners designate will be put through their paces um, also in relation to this issue of, of transparency, conflicts of interest as well. And I think as a result of that, we may see further pressure on all of these agencies, the, the regulatory agencies, to, um, to up their game because I think the public themselves are becoming a lot more conscientized uh, to these matters uh, and, and will become a lot more demanding. All right, I think we have la um, time for maybe a last round of, of questions or remarks. Yeah, I see one hand raised here. Please go ahead. Very interested in getting... Sorry, my name is Cormac Sheridan, and I'm a journalist. I write for a Thompson Reuters publication called BioWorld. I'm very interested in getting the panel's views, particularly those of, of Guido and Richard, on the pending likely move, or return at least, of the EMA to um, DG Enterprise. It's widely assumed that, that the industry lobbied to get this move. It would be very helpful if Richard could maybe disclose why it felt, if that being the case, that, that why this was necessary, what were the problems with EMA being under DG Sanko. And it would also just be very useful to get the panel view in general whether or not um, patient interests might be in some way compromised if, if this does go ahead. Go ahead. What we have done from the side of the industry is to suggest that the new commission should develop an integrated, comprehensive strategy for life sciences, and in particular for pharmaceuticals, the entire pharmaceutical industry, which includes generics, biologics, biosimilars, biotech, and everything. Okay? What we've called for is such a plan, and we've called for a person in the cabinet of the, of the, of the president to be the coordinator. We have not lobbied or even expressed a view exactly how you organize these units. It will be stupid of me to have a view on that, first of all. Now we have a presentation from the president of the commission how he wants to work. I think it looks good, and that's it. Okay? I'm not going to go lobby either or. Either or okay? This makes sense. I think overall, as, a, as an EU citizen, I think that the overall design is impressive. I think this is actually something new. We, we need something new to get Europe back, back on its feet, you know? And I think, you know, I, I for sure and my members are, are willing to support uh, Mr. Juncker with that, you know, however he wants to have this organized, okay? I'm not surprised about the reactions. I'm not surprised about the reactions, but I think, I think this is a non-issue. Where these units are is a non-issue, I think. Uh, I think what, so it would have made no difference if all of that had stayed under DG Senko. For you, it doesn't make any difference? Being under the new internal market and enterprise directive, which we must remember also what it is, gives the opportunity to have everything put together in one place. So we have had one unit in DG internal market that manages some of our issues. You know, we've had two, three issues in, three, two, three, um, actually three units in Sanko, one stays in Sanko, and they've got one unit in Enterprise, okay? Joining this up in one place makes a lot of sense, okay? But this is not something I'm going to lobby either for or against, you know? Now, I leave this to the President of the Commission to figure out how he wants to do this. Well, look, Glenis Wilpot, Wilmot, the, the lead rapporteur on the changes to the clinical trials regulation says that it was DG Enterprise that tried to block moves towards greater transparency. So I think we should be in no doubt that this is very dangerous for public health. And secondly, and more importantly in some respects, we should be in no doubt that it just looks incredibly seedy. And I think that's a really important issue when it comes to medicines regulation and public health. 
What this comes down to as far as the regulators are concerned, I think, is, is trust. Doctors and patients have to feel able to trust the summary judgments of regulators because otherwise we're at sea with this endless attempt to replicate. And, and you know, that's a shortcut which clinicians really value. So I think it's just incredibly, incredibly seedy. Right, one gentleman here had his hand raised and hasn't had the floor yet. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Bogart. I'm with the law firm Covington & Burling. I was also involved in some of this litigation. And we have had a lot of discussions about the uh, three court cases, but one thing has not been said. The, these cases concern three applications for access to CSRs. Two of them were actually made by competitors. It shows how important those documents can be from a commercial point of view. So we shouldn't forget, actually, that our system, which, as Ms. Riley has said, has been very effective. We've had new medicines for HIV. We have had vaccines. We've had a whole range of very interesting medicines that has been made available through a very performing system, which is based on expert review by Mr. Razi and his colleagues, but is also based on a principle which the Parliament accepted in the legislation that you need financial incentives to the private pharmaceutical companies to develop new medication. There's no conflict between commercial interests and the public health protection in that sense. Don't forget that, because if you want to always put commercial interests behind, you will not have the performing system we have now. All right. Um, yeah, one lady here. Yeah, I just have one comment, because... Um yeah, to Mr. Bergstrom. In an interview, um, in a, an article uh, published by Scrib, you were quoted saying that you were happy that your views have been heard by Junker and that all the units have been moved under the same DG. No, so I didn't if your comment views, on the units. Well, I did not comment on the units. I said that our views have a life science strategy no, and no, to concentrate no, on this well, sector. I think if your views have been heard, it means that a message has been communicated and you say you've never lobbied. So, well. Well, he said he's going to develop a strategy for the pharmaceutical industry. That's not what the that's quote what, that's says. That's all we asked for. At, in that article. If you read our statements, you'll see that's all we've asked for. I'm referring to the article on script. All right. Let's not dwell into this. There was one gentleman here at the back. Thank you very much. My name is Dirk Detkin. I'm from the European Food Safety Authority. Um, I allow myself to take the floor as the Ombudsman was kind enough to twice refer to the initiative we're doing at the moment with regard to um, independence and uh, um, act transparency. And of course, as was mentioned already before, like Emma, the European Food Safety Authority is also an authority that is basically based on the fact that it needs to produce excellent science and uh, generate trust by that. And if we don't do that, we actually don't have a raison d'etre. Uh, we're not worth uh, the, the reason why we were created. Now, on the context of that, I just wanted to add one element that uh, was perhaps missing in that debate uh, until now, and I think perhaps it's an outlook also uh, for the future. Uh, uh, transparency, according to uh, the discussion document that EFSA has right now at the moment on its web page for public consultation, I warmly invite you uh, to take part in that engagement, it consists of two elements. Uh, uh, it consists of the transparency as such, which is the access to the documents, and I think we discussed this here in a very, very interesting manner today. But what was missing perhaps already is the next step. How do you actually what do you do with the data? What is happening with the analysis of the action? So we're looking very much at the engagement afterwards. How do the public, how does this, this scientific excellence that we're generating there by using actually the modern technology tools, uh, by using actually the scrutiny of the public, how does that then become actually part of the decision-making process of uh, a public body? It's, of course, another... Uh, uh, element of huge complexity, so basically I'm just adding here to the complexity of the discourse, uh, uh, which might be considered unhelpful, but um, I think it's the next discussion that we're going to have in the upcoming years. After being transparent, how do we actually ensure the engagement of that transparency in the decision-making process? I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much. And uh, that actually gives us a good opportunity to, to wrap this discussion. I think it could have gone probably for uh, much longer, especially when we go deep into the details of who does what and processes and particular decisions. Obviously, there will be still a lot of discussions in the years forward uh, about transparency of clinical trials. We'll be following with great interest what happens with uh, the EMA uh, policy uh, later this week. Um, and, and certainly the, the, the wider discussion about the transparency in science uh, information which EFSA uh, is making. I indeed, it, it goes broader than just uh, medicines or the pharma sector. 
uh, but uh, there are cross-cutting issues here with other agencies and other uh, areas where science is used uh, as a fundamental uh, tool. Emily, maybe you want to say a few concluding words? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Frederick, and I'd like to thank uh, everybody for their attendance here today and also for the huge level of, of engagement uh, there was. Um, because I think that's a recognition of the importance of, of, of this issue. And I'd like to thank all of, all of our, our panellists for, um, uh, for coming and, and being so polite to each other, even, even if we are, uh, a lot of people are diametrically uh, different views um, to each other. But I think everybody um, here does, uh, do, does, uh, does valuable work, but, but equally uh, the valuable work, um, we, we have to scrutinise it and monitor it for the sake of the people that, that we all serve. Uh, the, the European, the European uh, citizen. Um, in, in a way, it, it's a pity that this uh, isn't taking place in perhaps in a few weeks' time when, when we, you unveil uh, your policy and then when you Hopefully. react to it and, and, and so on, and, and we can see uh, exactly um, what, what, uh, whether the, the claims in relation to full transparency or whatever are there and when we can begin to see all of those devils and all of those, um, all of those uh, details. Um, I spoke in my first few minutes about the, the ignorant layperson, and I'm thinking um, if, if, that, if that person or those people were here today, would they necessarily uh, be any the wiser? I, I'm not sure that they would be. I think they would be perhaps uh, aware of the parameters of the debate, but I, I still think um, that the jury is out in relation to whether um, people do actually feel that they are getting the, the information, the sufficient information um, that they need in order to make informed choices. And as the pharmaceutical industry develops, as more and more drugs and vaccines and whatever uh, come on the market, I, I think there's going to be the potential for even greater confusion and concern among the general public uh, about what is, uh, what, what, what is actually safe to take and, and who to trust uh, in, in relation to, uh, to that. We mentioned there was some conversation about TTIP. I'd just like to uh, reiterate the fact that, that we are looking at uh, uh, TTIP in relation to its transparency. We've launched a, a public uh, consultation and we would very much welcome contributions from uh, anybody uh, in this room, whether position papers you've already published or ideas you already have, in relation to what you think is necessary to know at this stage of the negotiations uh, to allow for uh, informed debate and to allow us uh, to know um, what is going on before it all comes in one big mass to the European Parliament and they're asked to, to vote uh, on, on what's likely to be a very complex and, 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 and difficult a agreement. Um, so um, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much indeed, Frederick, for, uh, for, for chairing this uh, so expertly and for, um, for avoiding the, the fistfights. Um, so um, uh, we're very grateful. Thank you all and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.